Hi, you beautiful New Zealanders. We're in our series called the Treaty for Newbies, and we're dealing with Article 2, Video 5. So we've actually had five videos about Article 2 so far. So if you haven't seen those, go back and see the whole lot because they're all kind of sequential and hierarchical. So you'll enjoy those. All right, let's crack into this today. So here is Article 2, Sentence 2, the Treaty of Waitangi, Article 2, Sentence 2. But the chiefs of the Confederation of United Tribes and the other chiefs grant to the Queen the exclusive rights of purchasing such lands as the proprietors thereof may be disposed to sell at such prices as may be agreed betwe between them and the person appointed by the Queen to purchase from them. Well, as you can see, this second sentence in Article 2 is all about land. And um, it's not controversial at all. So what does it actually mean? What's interesting is that the narrative we hear today from activists is that Maori were either diddled out of their land or they were forced to sell it or they had it unlawfully confiscated. So in today's video, we're going to bust these three myths. Pre-1840, that is pre the treaty, Maori had been vigorously selling their land to settlers. Dr. Bain Atwood describes the level of sales pre-1840 as spectacular. Now the reference to his book, that's page 141, it will come later in this video. So those, there is H.H. H. Turton who lived 1818 to 1887, and I'll tell you a little bit about him in a minute. At least one third of New Zealand was sold to settlers by Maori before 1840. Now New Zealand is 66 million acres. So at least one third of that, that's 20 million acres, was sold to settlers before 1840. The proof of this is in the H.H. H. Turton documents, which I have put in the description of this video. H.H. H. Turton was employed as a commissioner to investigate land claims. As part of this role, he instigated a project to gather together, transcribe, and translate thousands of documents relating to the sale and transfer of Maori land in the North Island, dating back to the earliest days of European settlement. I urge you to go to the description of this video, download the H.H. H. Turton documents and study them carefully. They are honestly, they're really eye-opening because they show you how keen Maori were to sell their land and how they did sell their land. What I want you to realize is that before Hobson arrived here on January the 29th, 1840, settlers had been arriving here in numbers and Maori were bending over backwards to sell them their land. It was not uncommon for Maori to sell the same piece of land to several different buyers, each buyer not knowing that their land had already been sold to others on the same day. Now this is Bruce Moon who's made a huge contribution to New Zealand and our history he says this. An 1878 letter from the chiefs Ihaia Kirikumara and Tamati Taroa stated that some Taranaki land had been sold three times to different buyers on the same day each buyer not aware that others had also purchased it and records exist in one case of five sales. So that was the sort of thing that was going on in New Zealand pre-1840. Okay, back to Article 2, Sentence 2. And here it is. I won't read that again. As I've said at the beginning, this second sentence in Article 2 is all about land. It looks pretty simple, doesn't it? The chiefs were to only sell their land to the British Crown. There were two conditions that needed to be satisfied when Maori chiefs sold their land. Maori had to want to sell the land. That is, they had to be disposed to sell. British, right from the get-go, wanted to protect Maori, making sure that they didn't sell land that they needed for the production of food for themselves. Lord Normanby, Hobson's superior had said in his 4200 word brief to Hobson, quote, you will not, for example, purchase from them, i.e. Maori, any territory the retention of which by them would be essential or highly conducive to their, that's Maori, their own comfort, safety or subsistence. So there it is, it's pretty clear. You can read Hobson's 4200 word brief in the description of this video. The second thing that was a condition of Maori selling their land, Maori had to agree to the price, i.e. the British government were keen to protect Maori from land sharks and entrepreneurs. When they purchased land, that is the British Crown, there was to be no bullying, intimidation or coercion. Dealings had to be fair, honest and transparent. Once again, hear the words of Lord Normanby to Hobson. Quote, all dealings with the natives for their lands must be conducted on the same principles of sincerity, justice and good faith as must govern your transactions with them for the recognition of Her Majesty's sovereignty in the islands. Nor is that all. They must not be permitted to enter into any contracts in which they might be ignorant and unintentional authors of injuries to themselves. See, really, you know, when you think about it, the British were absolutely batting for the Maori to protect them. So much for the narrative today that the colonials wrecked maori -dom. It's so far from the truth. The British even appointed what they called a protector of the Aborigines in April 1840. His name was George Clark. 
He was a missionary who'd been in New Zealand since 1824, fluent in Maori language and customs. He was to act for Maori, making sure they were not ripped off, and act for the crown, getting land for a good price. Okay, so you can see this role was inherently contradictory, but nonetheless, it was what it was. And what was the reason the British wanted Maori to sell exclusively to the crown? Well, at the time, Britain had 50 colonies on the go in 1840, and the development of New Zealand, e.g. schools, roads, bridges, hospitals, government buildings, etc., needed to be financed from income generated inside New Zealand. You see, the British couldn't have 50 colonies on the go and be financing all of them, so they made a decision to make sure that each colony was able to support itself financially. The British would buy the land from Maori and on sell it to settlers for a profit. That was the plan. Today, activists complain about this, accusing the then government of profiteering, in other words, ripping Maori off in the early colonisation period. Yet, you know what? These same activists drive on roads and use hospitals and schools paid for by the British financial plan in Article 2, Sentence 2 of the treaty, refusing to say thank you to the British pro for providing them. You know what? What is this? Well, it's just ungratefulness, that's what it is. And also, it's a bit stupid not being able to see. So how did land sales go in the early years of the colony? Maori were keen to sell, and they did sell. By 1843, they were so keen to sell that they were even putting pressure on the government to wriggle out of their mandate in the treaty to sell only to the British Crown. Rather, they wanted to sell to whoever wanted to buy their land. Can you get that? The governor in 1843 at the time, Fitzroy, agreed. It was a game changer. So Maori could now sell to anybody, not just the Crown, by 1843. Dr. Bain Atwood writes, by the first week of February 1843, they, the settlers, started to traffic in land in earnest and Maori as keen to sell as settlers were to buy. Look at that. So the British opened it up to Maori. You did not have to sell exclusively. Maori did not have to sell exclusively to the British Crown. They could sell to anybody. And boom, there was a land sales boom. So Maori were not holding back. And there's the reference. The only thing slowing Maori down from selling their land was Maori communal ownership of land. Let me explain. Remember I talked in previous videos about how it was top of mind for the British to survey Maori land, establish boundaries and issue titles? In this way, purchasers would know what they were buying, i.e. the exact boundaries were marked and put in writing. And sellers knew what they were selling exact boundaries were marked and put into row. Remember that? This was called establishing a crown title when that happened. Why did this slow Maori land sales down? Well, the British, trying to control and manage the sale of land, insisted that land could not be sold unless it had a crown title. This made Maori land sales difficult. Why? Maori land was owned by either a chief and his family or a, or a Maori family within the tribe or even multiple Maori families within a tribe. Some tribes had literally multiple pieces of land each owned by different families. The majority of family members had to agree to a sale before the land could be issued with a, tr with a crown title. So you can imagine infighting between Maori fam fa family members increased exponentially. Some Maori members of the family not wanting to sell, others wanting to sell, and so on. As far as the British were concerned, a chief did not have the right to sell land occupied by a Maori family in his tribe. He only had authority to sell the land of his own family, and even then, only with the permission of the majority of the family. It was the same for other families inside a tribal area. Other factors made things even more complicated. For example, if land was conquered, taken from a weak tribe by a strong tribe, who really owned the conquered land? The conquerors or the conquered? Well, the British asked questions like, how long does a piece of conquered land need to be occupied by the conqueror in order to be deemed theirs and therefore able to be sold? 20 years, said Governor Gore Brown. And that's from Ian Wishart's excellent book. Ian Wishart in his excellent book, The Great Divide, The Story of New Zealand and its treaty says, quote, the Crown had always maintained that because it recognised communal ownership of ancestral lands, it was also prepared to recognise the ability of hapu family groups to sell the plots they had personally lived on or controlled. The government would not, however, recognise that a chief had personal sovereignty rights over an entire tribe or hapu's land, precisely in the same fashion that it refused to allow any other tribal member to individually sell tribal land. If it was communally owned, argued official, then it was communally owned, and the smallest units they would deal with were hapu or extended whanau speaking solely for land under the, their direct control. See how it worked? So the British were trying to tidy up and manage land sales in New Zealand, and that was sort of their policy. And there's the reference. It would be true to say that if Maori did not hold land communally, and crown titles could have been issued easily and without complication, Maori would have sold the land in New Zealand 10 times over before 1845. 
The reason? Maori lusted for British goods. Muskets, shot powder, pots, pans, livestock of all kinds. Imported by the British, clothes, metal implements, sheet iron, just to name a few. Money from land sales could buy Maori what they really wanted and the British had what they really wanted. And so Maori were really lusting for the things that the British had and man, they were keen to sell land to get their hand on money so they could pay for them. That's how it really was. Another reason Maori were keen to sell their land? They wanted settlers to set up next to their past sites so they could trade with them. In other words, settlers bought trade and Maori wanted a slice of the action. Ultimately, it was about money and Maori wanted as much of it as they could get their hands on. You know what, I have no problem with this because all of us need to earn money. But let's reject the activist narrative that A, Maori land is sacred and that they would never have sold it and B, they were forced to sell their land and C, they didn't realise when they sold land, their land, that it had, was gone forever. You know what? Clearly A, B and C are absolutely, they're, they're BS. That's what they are. And yet this is the sort of stuff that gets peddled all the time. Out in the media and the activists and the Maori academics, this is what they tell you. It's not true. Historian Dr. Matthew Wright reports, quote, Europe's plants and tools transformed the basis of Maori subsistence economics and many hapu swung their productivity into producing flax and potatoes for trade. This rising demand for consumables including tobacco, clothing, liquor, seeds and munitions locked Maori into an economic relationship with the industrial age Britain. European goods, blankets, mirrors, needles, pipes, pots and clothing also became a part of a new currency of mana, a way in which status could be asserted. So what he's saying is Maori wanted to get all these things because they were like status symbols. They were like label clothing, label handbag. They were status symbols for Maori. Observing all this, one missionary wrote, quote, Now young New Zealanders believe in nothing but money. There you go. Governor Fitzroy reported back to the House of Commons, stressing what he regarded as ex the exorbitant prices the natives were asking for their lands. During Fitzroy's term as governor, he also reported a growing demand on the part of the natives to dispose of their lands without government interference or control. In other words, Mary were complaining the British Crown were not buying their land fast enough. There you go. Look at that. You don't hear that today, but that's the truth. That's straight from history. And Mary were jacking up the prices, asking exorbitant prices for their land. Well, I suppose there's nothing wrong with that. If you get the price, then that's what people t do today with all sorts of goods. Point is that Mary were actually banging on the government door saying, you're not buying land fast enough from us. Man, we don't hear that today. So far in this video, we've looked at Article 2, Sentence 2 of the Treaty and what it means. We've knocked over two of the big three myths pumped out by activists today regarding Maori land sales. They say Maori were diddled out of their land or they were forced to sell it. We've shown these to be completely false. What about the third myth that Maori had their land un unlawfully uh, confiscated? Well, let's finish by knocking this one over too. There's Sarapurana Nata. What a great man he was. This is a quote from Sarepa Rananata's book. Some have said that these confiscations were wrong and that they contravened the articles of the Treaty of Waitangi. The government placed in the hands of the Queen of England the sovereignty and the authority to make laws. Some sections of the Maori people violated that authority. War arose from this and blood was spilled. The law came into operation and land was taken in payment. It was their own chiefs who ceded that right to the Queen. Then he says these confiscations or the confiscations cannot therefore be objected to in light of the treaty. What he's saying is that, you know what, through the treaty, Maori ceded sovereignty, they became British citizens. They put themselves under the government of the British, the British made laws, and Maori broke those laws. And so there was consequences for breaking laws, and the British stepped in and confiscated land. It's not unlike the um, law that we have today for gangs with the confiscation of a property from gangs that they've acquired through illicit means. Government can come in and just take your property. Yeah, similar, very similar. It's a law. If you break the law, you suffer the consequences. And there's the reference from Sarepa Rananada's book. Okay, let's finish with this. Please order this book from Trust Publishing and read it carefully. It's by Dr. John Robinson. Who Really Broke the Treaty? It's a brilliant book. Its author, Dr. John Robinson, examines our history in detail. The basic thesis of, of the book is that the Crown have kept the treaty and that it's Maori who have broken the treaty. 
Well, man, you'd never hear that today, would you? And given that all payouts and settlements to Maori since 1840 are based on the Crown having been breaching the treaty, John Robinson asserts that they ought never to have happened. We should never have given Maori any payments or any settlements. That's what his thesis is. Tell you what, it's a really fascinating read, and it's just so worth reading to get a different perspective on all this. So if you want to get that book, just Google Trust Publishing, and the website will come up, and then you can order that book. It's a it's a real game changer. It's amazing. All right, thank you for watching our video on Article 2, Sentence 2. Please subscribe, like, comment. It makes a big difference when you do that, when you make comments and you subscribe and you pass the videos on to other people. That's so good. Thank you to those who are giving out our cards. You guys are absolute legends. Special thanks to those who are helping financially. That's really helping as well, helping us stay afloat. So big thank you to everybody. See you next time. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.